Lady Liberty, Bald Eagles, Bruce Springsteen, all things I associate with the country of America. Yet, there is no country in the world officially called America. What we do have, however, is the landmass that covers the majority of the Western Hemisphere that is called the Americas, the two continents that make up this landmass named North America and South America, and a country in North America called the United States of America, a country that's name is often shortened to the USA, the US, and of course, just America. How did so much of what we called the New World end up with America somewhere in its name? Where does the name America even come from, and who gave it that name? Now let's start things off at a slight tangent, because America wasn't always called America. The various tribes of natives in the land didn't have one set name for the continent as the tribes spoke a variety of languages. In the language of the Kuna people, the land is called Abayala. North America specifically has been called by various Native American tribes Turtle Island, which is such an awesome name. The name America is a Latinization of the name of Italian explorer Amelio Vespucci. While Columbus reached the land before Vespucci, he deemed it to not be a new land mass at all, but connected to Asia. It was Vespucci who argued that the land he explored on his travels was in fact not connected to Asia and is part of something he called the New World. Vespucci however did not name this land after him. German cartographer Martin Waldtzemuller created a new map of the world, one that labelled modern South America as America, in honour of Amerigo Vespucci. We can even go deeper into this subject however. If America is named after Amerigo Vespucci, then who was Americo Vespucci named after? It's believed Amerigo Vespucci was named after St. Americ of Hungary. The supercontinent was eventually split into two smaller, but still pretty big, continents of North America and South America. So, say if you're travelling from one end of the Americas to another, from Greenland to Chile, when would you have to stop calling the land you're in North America and start calling it South America? The border of North and South America lies on the Isthmus of Panama, an Isthmus being a narrow strip of land with water on both sides, and the country of Panama is generally considered to be the most southern part of North America, with Colombia being the most northern part of South America. Maybe However, you've heard of a third name for a specific landmass of the Americas, Central America. Central America consists of seven countries, Belize, Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica and the aforementioned Panama, all of which are part of the North American continent. So what about that country we all call America, the one that's actually called the United States of America? No one knows who was the first to call it this. The first publication of the name comes from an anonymous essay in a newspaper from Virginia on April 6th, 1776. The name was used again by John Dickinson in the second draft of the Article of Confederation, and in Jefferson's original draft of the Declaration of Independence he wrote the phrase United States of America, yet in the final version this was changed to the 13 United States of America. Yet just the United States of America was still used within the preamble of the Constitution. The continent of the Americas and the country of the USA have always been a place where a huge variety of people, beliefs and cultures come together, and this can be even seen from the land's name. America was named by a German, who got the name from an Italian, who was likely named after a Hungarian. It's a name that can always be a simple reminder of America's multicultural history. In 1624, the Dutch West India Company sent around 30 families to live and work on an island in the northeast of a country that would go on to become the United States of America. They called this settlement New Amsterdam in ode to the city in their homeland. The land had previously been called New Agolem, named by Italian explorer Giovanni da Velozeno in honour of the French King Francis I who had previously been court of the commune in Agolem. New Amsterdam eventually moved when the governor purchased the larger Manhattan Island from the natives. The settlement kept the name New Amsterdam and grew and grew. In 1664, however, the British seized New Amsterdam and changed its name, naming it in honour of the Duke of York, and from here are the origins to Earth's most iconic city, New York City. New York's Dutch origins can still be seen in places, however, with orange and tulips scattered across the city's flags. This mixture of Dutch and English colonisation is not only present present in the changing of the city's name, but also in the names of the five just as iconic boroughs of New York City, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Manhattan, Queens and Staten Island. NYC's interwoven multicultural history explains to us this eclectic collection of names. The Bronx actually comes from a family name, a name belonging to Jonas Bronk. Jonas's early life seems to be a bit of a mystery. Swedish born, though this is still up for debate, he eventually emigrated to Denmark. 
then to the Netherlands, eventually marrying a Dutch woman and sailing to New Amsterdam as it was called at the time. This migration was due to the local economy in the Netherlands falling to pieces thanks to, and trust me I'm not making this up, tulip mania. Jonas and his wife flourished here. Here he established a farm on the eastern bank of a river, a river that would eventually be named after him, however with a different spelling of his surname, the Bronx River, which of course led to the naming of the borough of the Bronx. Brooklyn's name comes from New York's Dutch origin. The name Brooklyn comes from the Dutch word for marshland, Brooklyn, which is also the name for a small town in the Netherlands. So I guess New York is the home of New Brooklyn, kinda. Many places in New York are named after Dutch places and things. Harlem is named after the Dutch city of Harlem. And Coney Island's name comes from the anglicization of the Dutch Konyen Island, meaning Rabbit Island. The name of the borough of Staten Island is also of Dutch origins. The official name of Dutch Parliament is the States General, which in Dutch is Staten General, meaning Staten Island is named after the Dutch government. Queens, however, is from New York's English heritage. Queens was named in 1683 in honour of Queen Catherine of Braganza, who was the wife of King Charles II of England. Queens was named in correlation with Kings County, which was named after the aforementioned King Charles II. Kings County is the biggest county in New York State and shares its boundaries with modern Brooklyn. However, the most famous of all of New York's boroughs, Manhattan, has a name that doesn't come from Dutch or English. Manhattan's name comes from the language of the Lenape native Americans and derives from the word Manahata. Its first known recordings is in the 1609 logbook of Robert Jewett on his travels into what would now be New York Harbor. It is thought that the name means island of many hills in the Lenape language. The Lenape, also known as the Delaware, are the Native Americans native to the area that covers New York City before it was called New York, New Amsterdam or even New Ogolem. These natives called the land Lenape Hawking. Yet, of course, while New York has an iconic name as do its boroughs, it also has an iconic nickname, the Big Apple. The nickname Big Apple was originally coined in 1920. Despite New York State being America's top apple grower, its origins actually lie in horse racing. NYC newspaper sports journalist John Fitzgerald heard of sable hands in New Orleans calling New York the Big Apple. He liked that name and began using it in his columns. The name ended up being used at jazz clubs in the 1930s. Jazz musicians used it to allow people to know that New York City was the home of jazz. The name however did fall out of popularity until the 1970s when a big tourist campaign revitalized the name and since then New York and Big Apples have been synonymous. America is often referred to as a melting pot, a place where many cultures meet and come together. And where else is this easier to see than in the names of the boroughs in its most populated city? Every state in the United States of America have an official nickname. Most of these are pretty easy to understand as to how and why they got these nicknames. Florida is the sunshine state due to how much sun they get down there. Georgia is known as the peach state due to the quality of the peaches grown there. And Arizona is known as the Grand Canyon state as well. It's home to the Grand Canyon. Yet one of the state nicknames, perhaps one of the more well-known nicknames of one of the more well-known states to those outside of the US, isn't quite as clear to us at first. I'm of course talking about the state of Texas and their nickname, the Lone Star State. So I guess first we should address exactly where the name Texas comes from. It'd be pretty weird if we explain the nickname without explaining the actual name first. The name Texas is of Native American origin, coming from the Caddo language, the language of the Caddo people. This Caddo word being Tasha, which means friends or ally in the Caddo language. This name however wasn't given by the Caddo people but by the Spanish settlers on the land who not only called the land Tasha but called the Caddo people themselves Tasha too, with Tasha eventually transforming into the name Texas. It's really cool that the Spanish settlers of Texas referred to the natives as friends and allies. But yes, it was the Spanish settlers who named Texas, as while we now know Texas as the second biggest state in the US, Texas was once part of Mexico, and interestingly their flag featured two stars, as opposed to the one lone star Texas became known for. However, the people of Texas didn't wish to be part of Mexico, and wanted to be their own independent sovereign state. This led to a war of independence between the Mexican state of Texas and Mexico which lasted from 1835 to 1836. It was here the imagery of the lone star started to become 
more prominent in Texas. However, the Lone Star was used earlier in the history of Texas, such as the flag carried by James Long in 1819 in an earlier unsuccessful expedition to free Texas of Spanish control. Coins have even been found in modern San Antonio from 1817 with a Lone Star on them. It seems Texas and the Lone Star have always gone hand in hand. Regardless of these earlier Lone Stars, Lone Star's flags also flew during Texas's claim for independence, being seen at the Battle of Concepcion and at the Siege of Bexar, both in 1835. It's believed that this Lone Star represented Texas's wishes to be a state of the USA, how their Lone Star should join the rest of the stars on the US flag, while others believe that the Lone Star represented Texas's wish to be a lone independent state, not part of Mexico or the US. Regardless, in 1836, Texas did gain independence from Mexico and became the Independent Republic of Texas. It was as an independent republic that Texas got its famous Lone Star flag. Forgive me if this video has become more about the Lone Star flag than the Lone Star name, but it wasn't the one we know today. This was a flag that featured a gold star, as if it were just one of the stars from the aforementioned Mexican Texas flag on a blue background. Three years later, however, the flag we know today was born, and in 1845, Texas joined the Union and became the Lone Star State of the United States of America. So, why is Texas known as the Lone Star State? Well, it's to represent the history of the state, from its struggles to be independent from Mexico, to some today who believe that Texas should become independent once again. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to be free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless, tempest tossed to me, I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Now, after seeing the name of this video, you may think the answer to this question is kind of obvious. It's called the Statue of Liberty. And yes, while the statue as a whole is called the Statue of Liberty, that doesn't mean the woman in the statue is called that. That would be like saying the four faces in Mount Rushmore are all called Mount Rushmore too. So yes, while this monument as a whole may be called the Statue of Liberty, what exactly is her name? You may be thinking, well, it's obvious. She's called Lady Liberty. And to be honest, you aren't that far off the point. Though Lady Liberty seems to be more a nickname than an official name. The more fancy name for Lady Liberty would be Libertas, the Roman goddess of freedom and the embodiment of liberty. And of course the word liberty as we know it today comes from this Roman goddess's name, as well as coming from the Latin Libertatum. Of course, being a Roman goddess means that depictions of Libertas started way before the Statue of Liberty. She was seen on Roman coins and in other works of art. Yet she made her way into the American conscious in the colonial era when they yearned for freedom and liberty from the British rule. In fact, it's believed she was first depicted in American culture in 1766 in an obelisk created by Paul Revere. As time went on, Libertas, or Lady Liberty, became a mainstay in American iconography. And of course, the Statue of Liberty was gifted to the nation from France on their 100th birthday. Libertas became a figure of importance for the French too during the French Revolution. This, however, wasn't always meant to be the case. In fact, the Statue of Liberty wasn't meant to depict Libertas. In fact, it wasn't even meant to go to America. The creator of the statue, Fidjuluk Ugu, Auguste Batodi actually intended for the statue to go to Egypt, where it would sit pretty in the Suez Canal, and wanted to create something as timeless as those to be in Egypt too. And of course in Egypt too the statue was to look rather different, being dressed in Arab peasant clothing. However, once plans for it to be erected in Egypt fell through, Batodi looked to America to home his statue, retooling the colossus to depict Lady Liberty instead. It's from these Egyptian origins where we can start looking into the name of the Statue of Liberty in another light. Not what's the name of the character the statue depict but more, what was the model for the Statue of Liberty called? As like most artwork depicting the human form, there had to have been someone who it was modelled after. So what was their name? Well, like I said, the statue was originally meant to be a gift to Egypt, and it's because of this many believe that the model for the Statue of Liberty was in fact an Arab woman, as the statue was originally meant to be a welcoming beacon to the Arab world. However, aside from this idea that the statue was modelled after an Arab woman, we seem to know nothing about who this Arab woman was exactly, or even her name. But it's not only an Arab woman who the Statue of Liberty is thought to be modelled after. We actually have a few other contenders. One person it's thought to be is Isabella Boyer, widow or friend of Balatordi, Isaac Singer, though this is thought to be somewhat of a myth. The more concrete evidence we have is that the statue is an amalgamation of two women in Balatordi's life. The body of the statue is thought to belong to his wife, Gian Emilie Balatordi, though as much as he cared for his wife, he didn't feel her face was right for the statue, so for the face he turned to his mother, Charlotte Balatordi. We even have photos of his mother, 
and it's not too hard to see similarities between the mother of the designer and the mother of liberty. So back to that original question, what is the name of the lady in the Statue of Liberty? Well the clearest answer is Libertas, but we could also call her Isabelle, Jean Emily, or even Charlotte. Though perhaps this is just me being a bit too curious. I mean, the statue itself isn't even called the Statue of Liberty. When it was being designed by Bartholdi and constructed by Gustav Eiffel, I'm sure that name rings a bell. It actually went by a different name altogether, Liberty Enlightening the World. New York is perhaps the most famous city on the face of the earth, from the history that's happened in the city to the amount of pop culture centred around it. It seems like most parts of the city are part of the public conscious. Ask someone to name a famous building and they'll quite likely say the Empire State Building. Ask someone to name a famous park and they'll quite likely say Central Park. Ask someone to name a famous bridge and they'll quite likely say Brooklyn Bridge. Previously on the channel we've looked at how the city became New York from New Amsterdam, how its five boroughs got their names, and even looked into the true identity of Lady Liberty herself. If you haven't guessed by this video and the last one, I went to New York recently. So today let's go even deeper and look into how some of the city's iconic neighbourhoods ended up with their iconic names. Something interesting about New York neighbourhoods is that a lot of them fit into certain naming conventions, perhaps the dullest of these conventions being the neighbourhoods named after directions, such as Upper East Side, Upper West Side, Midtown, all that sort of dull stuff. These might be pretty dull etymologies, but nevertheless these are the names that have survived and maintained to be some of New York's most popular neighbourhoods. What's more interesting however is the collection of neighbourhoods that names are actually acronyms or words compounded together. Take the Brooklyn neighbourhood of Dumbo. While you may think it is named after everyone's favourite flying elephant, it's actually an acronym based on where the neighbourhood is located, with Dumbo actually meaning down under the Manhattan Bridge overpass. When I first heard Tribeca, for some reason I thought that name might be deep rooted in Greek or Latin. I'm not too sure why but to my ears it just sounded somewhat ancient. Tribeca is actually a shortening of Triangle Below Canal Street, with the triangle being the boundaries of the neighbourhood, Canal Street, West Street, Broadway and Vesey Street, as Google Maps informs me. Though some of the boundaries are debated, and yes, it's not actually a triangle. Soho is too an acronym, but what's interesting about Soho is that there's actually a place called Soho in London too. Though New York was under British rule, like we see with the neighbourhood of Chelsea, Soho New York wasn't named after Soho London. Soho New York comes from south of Houston, reference in Houston Street in NYC. While Soho London is believed to come from a hunting cry hunters of the 16th century would use in the land to call back their hunting dogs, though this etymology is still somewhat up for debate. And in relation to Soho New York, we have NoHo New York, which if you haven't figured out by now means north of Houston Street. Of course, with a city as grand as New York, you are going to have a huge diversity of people arrive and start a life for themselves. A lot of the time, these people of a shared culture live together and form their own communities within the city city, with the neighbourhood they reside in being named after this. If you haven't guessed by now, I'm talking about none other than New York's own Little Italy and Chinatown, named after their Italian and Chinese residents respectively. So let's start looking into some of the more unique neighbourhood names that grace the city, with a good place to start being at the north of Manhattan with the neighbourhood of Harlem. The neighbourhood of Harlem was actually settled originally by the Dutch settlers of New York, well New Amsterdam I should say, and named after the city of Harlem in the Netherlands. Perhaps one of the oddest names you'll find find across all the neighbourhoods of New York is the place where the devil himself resides, Hell's Kitchen. There's a few ideas as to how this name of Hell's Kitchen came about. All sources seem to derive from quotes of people talking about the area, referring to it as Hell's Kitchen, and the name just sticking. Hell's Kitchen used to be one of the most dangerous parts of the city, but nowadays thanks to gentrification, I need to make a video on that term, the neighbourhood is far more safe. American frontiersman Davy Crockett talked about the Irish slums of New York, explaining how, in my part of the country, when you meet an Irishman, you'll find a first rate gentleman, but these are worse than savages. They are too mean to swab Hell's Kitchen. Then the name first appeared in print later in 1881 in a New York Times article looking into a multiple murder when it is once again called Hell's Kitchen. And apparently, the most well known story of its origins is with Dutch Fred the Cop, a veteran police officer who was out in the neighborhood with his rookie partner. The rookie said, This place is hell itself, with Fred merely retorting that Hell's a mild climate, this is Hell's Kitchen. Whichever of these these stories are true, they all seem to relate to what a crime ridden area
area Hell's Kitchen once was, specifically implying that being in Hell's Kitchen is worse than being in Hell itself. Anyway, let's move on to the neighbourhood of Astoria in Queens. Astoria was named after, of all things, a fur trader, John Jacob Astor, who was one of the richest men in America at the time. This name was given by fellow fur merchant Stephen A. Housey, who hoped that by naming it after the multi-millionaire it would persuade him to invest in the area. Before this, however, Astoria went by a different name, Hallett's Cove, named after Englishman William Hallett. Keeping with Queens, we have the neighbourhood of Flushing, which if you're anything like me, when you think of Flushing, this clip from The Simpsons will come to mind. The neighbourhood, however, isn't named after the act of flushing a toilet, but like Harlem was named after a place in the Netherlands, which is called Flushingen, which over time became Flushing in New York. Like I stated at the start of this video, this was just a tiny look at a small amount of the neighbourhoods of New York. There are many I didn't mention. Poor old Staten Island and the Bronx had no neighbourhoods mentioned at all, so leave comments down below about how other the neighborhoods of New York got their names. And of course, if you are watching this in New York, please let me know what neighborhood you are watching from. Despite there being 45 presidents in the history of the United States of America, there has definitely not been 45 unique names. In fact, there have only been 29 unique first names across all the people to ever be president. These are George, John, Thomas, James slash Jimmy, Andrew, Martin, William slash Bill, Zachary, Millard, Franklin, Abraham, Ulysses, Rutherford, Chester, Grover, Benjamin, Theodore, Woodrow, Warren, Calvin, Herbert, Harry, Dwight, Lyndon, Richard, Gerald, Ronald, Bragg, and Donald with the most popular first name among presidents being James, with six presidents having this first name. James Madison, James Monroe, James K. Polk, James Buchanan, James A. Garfield, and James Carter, though he was more popularly known as Jimmy Carter. There's also been four Johns and four Williams and three Georges. As for surnames, well on the whole they are more unique. Most presidents have unique surnames, with there being 39 unique surnames between all the presidents, these being Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler, Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lincoln, Johnson, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, McKinley, <gasps> Roosevelt, Taft, Wilson, Harding, Coolidge, Hoover, Truman, Eisenhower, Kennedy, Nixon, Ford, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Obama and Trump. There isn't one surname that dominates over all the other surnames, but in fact five pairs of presidents share surnames. The two Roosevelts, Theodore and Franklin, who were cousins. The two Harrisons, William and Benjamin, who were grandfather and grandson. And the two Johnsons, Andrew and Lyndon, who while were not family, funnily enough shared the similarity of both becoming president when their predecessors were assassinated. And of course there have been presidents that have not only shared last names but first names too. Most recently there's been George H.W. Bush and George W. Bush who were father and son, as well as John Adams and John Quincy Adams, who too were father and son. Also an interesting quirk is that the 22nd and 24th president also had the exact same name, Grover Cleveland. But this is because they were the exact same person, making Grover Cleveland the only president so far to have two non-consecutive terms as president. So even though we say there have been 45 presidents, there's really only been 44. We kind of mentioned how two presidents were known more by their nicknames than actual names, Jimmy Carter and Bill Clinton, but these were not the only two presidents to not be known publicly by their birth names. In fact, let's stick with Bill Clinton for a moment. He was actually born William Jefferson Blythe III, receiving that surname from his father who died in a car accident three months before he was born. When he was seven, his mother remarried a man named Roger Clinton and as a gesture, Bill changed his surname legally from Blythe to Clinton. Gerald Ford was actually born with a completely different name, Leslie Lynch King, sharing this name with his father, until his parents divorced and Leslie took on the name of his stepfather at the age of two, with his stepfather too being called Gerald Ford. Dwight David Eisenhower was originally called David Dwight Eisenhower, but his mother swapped his names around so him and his father David would not get mixed up. While he wasn't born with a different name, Franklin Roosevelt was born without any name. He was nameless for seven weeks, but he was then named after his great uncle Franklin Hughes Delano. Harry S. Truman's parents couldn't too decide on a name for their boy taking them a month to decide on Harry. In the opposite direction to this, a lot of people seem to believe that Donald Trump was actually born with the name Donald Drumpf, and while the family surname was initially Drumpf when his grandfather arrived in the States, the name had transformed to Trump way before Donald was even born. At the start of this video, I said all the unique first names of the US presidents, and while they were the names these presidents were popularly known by, they weren't all actually their first names. Four presidents were more popularly known by their middle names. We can add Hiram and Stephen to the list of unique first names too, as they were the birth names of presidents Ulysses Grant and Grover Cleveland respectively. And we can also add another John with John Calvin Coolidge and another Thomas with Thomas Woodrow Wilson. 
Let's look at the origins of these surnames. The largest majority of presidential surnames seem to be patronomic, which means they derive from a father or ancestor. From my research, this includes the surnames of Adams, Jefferson, Jackson, Harrison, Fillmore, Pierce, Johnson, Arthur, McKinley, Wilson, Harding, Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, and Obama, meaning 17 presidents have patronomic surnames. Just behind these are 15 presidents with habitual or topographic surnames, which means their surnames relate to geography or home settlements. These are Washington, Monroe, Van Buren, Polk, Buchanan, Lincoln, Hayes, Garfield, Cleveland, Roosevelt, Taft, Ford, and Bush. Six surnames appear to be occupational, meaning they come from occupations of ancestors, with these being Tyler, Taylor, Coolidge, Hoover, Eisenhower, and Carter. The rest come from various other routes. A lot of presidents use the first letter of their middle name too, as we see with George W. Bush and Lyndon B. Johnson to name a couple examples, yet a lot of them not only didn't use this initial publicly, but simply didn't have middle names. 17 presidents flat out had no middle names. Even a couple presidents who did use the middle initial didn't really have middle names. While the S in Harry S. Truman's name did represent his middle name, it was just that. His middle name was just S, and it wasn't short for anything. Both his maternal and paternal grandfather's names began with S, so instead of the deciding on one, his folks just left it as an S to represent both of them. We established that Ulysses was Hiram Ulysses Grant's middle name, but he too had an S when being president, being known as Ulysses S. Grant. This S exists solely due to an error when it was accidentally added by a congressman when he was signed to attend a military academy. George H. W. Bush is the only president to have two middle initials, and no middle name repeats themselves across the names of the presidents, well minus the W in George H. W. and George W. Bush, which both stand for Walker. Despite these people being the President of the United States of America, a lot of these names aren't American in origin. The USA is known as a country that was founded on migration, and it shows in the President's names. Names like Washington and Lincoln come from England. Kennedy and Arthur are thought to be Celtic. Roosevelt, Hoover and Van Buren are Dutch. Pierce, Fillmore, Grant and Carter are believed to have Norman roots. Eisenhower and Trump are Germanic. And of course, Obama is a Kenyan surname. There are a few better places to see the USA as a melting pot than in these names. What about the nitty gritty of these names? The letters that make them up. If we're using the names these presidents are most publicly known by, including middle initials and the few who use their full middle name, then every letter in the English alphabet is present, with the tricky letters like Q, X, and Z being accounted for thanks to John Quincy Adams, Richard Nixon, and Zachary Taylor. R appears to be the most commonly repeating letter in all the president's names, with it being used 61 times when writing the names of every US president, though Grover Cleveland messes things up a bit by having his name there twice. But even when only using his name once, R still wins out. The longest first name is Rutherford, consisting of 10 letters, with the shortest being John and Bill with only 4 letters, while the longest surnames belong to Washington and Eisenhower with 10 letters each, with Ford and Taft being the shortest with just 4 letters. Finally, if you add up all the letters of these names, including middle names slash initials, then the shortest name is John Adams with just 9 letters, and the longest being William Henry Harrison with 10 letters. I for one could not tell you a single thing that William Henry Harrison did during his presidency, but he clearly had the foresight use his full middle name and not just initial so he could have the longest presidential name and be the last president to be mentioned at the end of this video. The United States of America is a seriously huge country. In fact, the entire land area that the USA covers is 3,531,905 square miles, which safe to say is huge. In fact, by land area is the third largest country on earth, though it drops down to fourth behind China and Canada if you include their owned water. Nevertheless, however, this country is massive. And having a country this huge means that it must get pretty hard to keep track of everywhere. If only there was some sort of way that this huge country could be split up into small smaller areas. Perhaps these smaller areas could have names unto themselves which I could explain in a really cool video. Of course, the United States of America is broken down into its name given 50 states, each one with a name unto themselves, all with interesting stories behind them. And I know how many people want to see that video. However, as that video would be such an undertaking, I've decided to make it when we hit a thousand dollars a month on Patreon. When we finally reach that target, I intend on making a huge video explaining how every state of the USA got their name and their official nickname. So if you want to see that video, please consider donating on Patreon. Even just $1 a month helps the channel in a huge way, and it gets you loads of name explained extras, and it brings us closer to our $1,000 a month goal, and a video about the names and nicknames of the states of the USA. Anyway, this video isn't about the states of the
the USA, but rather another way that the USA has been broken up into areas over the years. This is of course the belts of the United States of America. These belts are large or quite small chunks of America that cross across states that all have something in common. However, there isn't just one kind of thing that allows something to be a belt. Belts can be decided on what is commonly grown there, the weather there, what is produced there, or what kind of people are there. They also aren't as defined as the states of the USA. A lot of the borders of these belts aren't really that concrete and these belts aren't officially in place or anything. They're more colloquial terms people use when talking about chunks of America. It's not only the USA however that has belts. In India we have the Hindi belt which is a region of north central India where varieties of the Hindi language are spoken. The tin belt in Bolivia where many minerals are mined, of course including tin. There's even asteroid belts up in space. And the whole of Europe has been broken into three belts. Now what subject could Europe be broken up into? Well the one thing that brings us all together, alcohol. To alcohol, the cause of and solution to all of life's problems. These are of course Europe's alcohol belts. These three regions that people have broken Europe into dictate what the preferred alcoholic drink of choice is for those in Europe. On the whole, this breaks into Northern Europe being the vodka belt, Central Europe being the beer belt, and Southern Europe being the wine belt, which really makes sense. When I think of beer, countries like Belgium and Germany come to mind, France and Italy for wine, and of course Russia for vodka. Though of course it really isn't that black and white. I've had some very good Italian beer in my time. Before we look into the belts of America however, I have to ask myself, why are these called belts? A belt is the kind of thing you use to keep your trousers around your waist and to show how good at pro wrestling you are. Why are these regions of land also dubbed belts? Apparently this comes from the way crops grow. As I mentioned, and as you will see, a lot of these belts are named after crops that are grown there, as crops tend to be grown on lines of latitude as climates are similar over latitudes as opposed to longitudes. With this, crops were grown in long narrow strips, and this reminded people of belts, so they were dubbed belts, though the only info I could find on this was via Wikipedia with a big old citation needed next to it, so take it with a pinch of salt. Though this coining of the term belt for these regions of land makes sense to me, however as this term was cemented into language, places that definitely aren't belt shaped have also been dubbed belts. And for completion's sake we should really look into the etymology of belt initially, as in the thing we wear around our trousers, though it doesn't have the most interesting etymology, all we seem to know about it is that it roots from the Latin belletius, meaning girdle slash sword belt, however belt has gone on to be used in all kinds of ways in language, from phrases like below the belt for unfair things and tighten your belt meaning to spend less money. Belt has even become a verb meaning either to hit someone or speak slash sing very loudly. A great song can even be called a belter. Anyway, that's enough literal belt talk, we're here to talk about the belts of America. It seems that there are 20 recognised belts of America so let's take a look at them all. However, if I've missed any belts let me know. These seem to be a very colloquial term so perhaps you have a belt term for where you live that you have coined. I would love to hear them in the comments. The first one we should cover isn't actually that defined, that being the banana belt. It isn't actually just one banana belt in the USA but a few. Lots of areas of the USA are referred to as banana belts, from places like southwestern North Dakota to places in California. Places even outside the US have been dubbed banana belts too. The reason for these places being called banana belts is due to the fact that these areas tend to have warmer weather and less rain in relation to their surrounding areas, the kind of weather that bananas would be able to be grown in. Though I don't know if this means that everywhere that is dubbed a banana belt actually grows bananas. I mean, if this was the case then Iceland would be a banana belt, as they claim to have Europe's largest banana plantation. Which sounds odd, Iceland really doesn't have the right climate for it. However, Iceland's agricultural university have a large greenhouse powered by their own geothermal heat where they do in fact grow bananas, which is kind of crazy. Somewhere in the middle of nowhere, in a country of ice literally in its name can grow such an exotic fruit. Banana itself is actually a word that has remained more or less unchanged for centuries. It seems to be first recorded in the 1500s from a West African language, where it was still written as banana. A more defined belt in the USA is the Bible Belt, which seems to be one of the more known belts of the USA. You may have heard it on the news, especially during presidential elections, with various candidates trying to win the Bible Belt and phrases like that. The Bible Belt is seen to cover a huge amount of the USA, especially in the southeast of the nation, covering whole states and ending in parts of Florida and Texas. Because the Bible Belt seems to have more attention on it, we have more information on it, even records of its first use. It was first used by American satirist H. L. Menken in 1925 from one of his works of fiction set in what he would dub the Bible Belt. So despite this term being used in a derogatory sense to begin with, the name has stuck around. The reason this part of the US is called the Bible Belt is because on the whole people in this area of the country tend to be
be more socially conservative and they have higher church attendance rates than other parts of the USA, hence why it's named after the sacred text of Christianity. The name Bible itself comes from the Latin phrase Biblia Sacra, meaning holy books, so that's why the English word Bible sounds so similar to other words languages for library, like the Italian Biblioteca. Also within the Bible Belt we have the Black Belt, which too is in southeastern USA. The black in this name actually has two kinds of meanings, and no, neither of these refer to the amount of karate experts in the area. At first this area was called the Black Belt in relation to the dark black fertile soil in the area, specifically in central Alabama. Of course this fertile soil meant that much farming could take place here, and with that much farming means there has to be people to work on these farms. This is where the less pleasant reasoning behind this name comes into play, as the people who worked on these farms in the past would have been slaves, who would have been black. Due to the colour of the slave skin, the Black Belt name took on a different meaning altogether. While slavery is no longer present in the state, there is still a large African American population in the Black Belt due to this history. The modern word black in English evolved from the old English black, which meant the exact same thing. A belt that doesn't seem to exist anymore is the Borscht Belt. This is the name for a series of resorts in the Catskills Mountains in southern New York. These resorts were seemingly run and visited by the Jewish community of New York, and this is where the name comes from as Borscht is a type of soup from Eastern Europe, which has become heavily associated with Jews. In fact, at one point in time, when this belt was up and coming, being synonymous with Jews. So, this part of America with a strong Jewish population was named after this foodstuff. Now, however, the Borscht Belt Resort seemed to have been left abandoned. Borscht itself, however, comes from Russian, meaning cow parsnip, which was an original ingredient for making the soup. As I mentioned earlier, the reason a lot of these belts have their names is simply due to what's grown there, so the names aren't as fun as the ones we've just mentioned. So instead of going over all of these one at a time, saying the exact same thing with just a different noun before belt, let's cover them all here quickly. In the Midwest we have the Corn Belt, where a large amount of the nation's corn is grown, the Cotton Belt, located in Southeast America, where a lot of cotton is grown, the Fruit Belt, located in the Great Lakes region, where much fruit is grown, the Pine Belt, located in Mississippi, where many pine trees grow, the Rice Belt, predominantly in Arkansas, where rice is grown, and the wheat belt, which covers a huge chunk of the United States where, you guessed it, wheat is grown. Like I said, these aren't as interesting names to delve into, but these belts of America are of huge importance for feeding so many of us, and all these names are pretty ancient words, coming from words like corn, crouton, fluctus, pinus, osia, and wheat respectively. Apologies to anyone who lives in these belts and feel annoyed that I've somewhat skipped over them. Like I said, they are really important, just not very interestingly named. And also I'm going to mention this here, it's not a grown produce like fruit or veg, but we have the lead belt in southeast Missouri, as they are known for mining and producing lots of lead. Just wanted to get that one out there. We also have parts of America that's belts are named after the kinds of weather they have predominantly there. In the northeast of the USA we have the frost belt, with its name coming from the cold winters and large amount of snow the region gets. The word frost itself comes from the Old English frost. Within the frost belt are two smaller belts that relate to just how cold it is there. There's the snow belt that covers the more northern points of the frost belt that attracts the most snow out of pretty much anywhere in the USA. And the salt belt, not named due to the amount of salt produced here but due to the fact that roads are salted regularly due to the ice and snow on them. Snow and salt both respectively come from the Old English snar and sialt. And in the complete opposite we have the sun belt that is in the complete opposite location of the frost slash snow slash salt belts covering all the south of the USA, named obviously due to the lovely sunshine they get here. And once again, sun comes from the old English sun. For a time, Indiana had a belt all to itself. In the late 1800s, large amounts of natural gas were discovered in the state. This of course led to a lot of extraction of these gases, subsequently leading to a time in history known as the Indiana gas boom. Part of Indiana that the gas was being extracted from became known as the gas belt. However, by the 1920s it seems that this gas boom was over. However, it's a belt from the history books for sure. The Jello belt has to take the award for the strangest name belt of all the belts of the USA. But why is it called this? Is it due to the fact they grow more jello than anywhere else in America? Well, no. As much as it pains me to say it, Jell-O doesn't grow on trees. In fact, it pains me to say Jell-O full stop, but more on that in a bit. The Jell-O belt is in the west of the United States and is also known as the Mormon Corridor and even the Mormon belt. It is known by these Mormon related names as there are a high amount of Mormons in this part of the state. But why Jell-O? This is because Mormons and Jell-O are heavily associated with one another, which is something I didn't know before I began researching this video. Apparently Mormons love Jell-O so much because they can't smoke or drink, allowing sweet treats like Jell-O to be their vice. While another idea I read is because Jell-O marketed their products to families, and in Mormonism family is very important. So that's how this part of the nation got this odd name. And like I said, Jell-O as a Brit is a word I really don't enjoy saying. From what I could gather, what is called Jell-O in America we call Jelly here in the UK. However, what America Americans called jelly, we call jam, which is all just a bit silly. 
An interesting belt resides in the northeast of the nation yet again, and what's interesting about it is that it's had two different belt names over its history. Originally it was known as either the manufacturing slash factory slash steel belt, and this name comes from the fact there was a huge iron, steel and manufacturing industry in this area of the state. However, this industry eventually left the area, allowing all these once thriving factories to become desolate and empty, bringing huge economic troubles to all those who lived and worked in this area. These factories and the machinery within them still stand there but have been victims to time, becoming covered in rust. And this is why this area is now called the Rust Belt, to reflect the boom this part of America once had, but has now, literally and figuratively, been left to rust away. Within the Rust Belt are a lot of swing states, so you'll hear a lot of coverage about how they will vote when it comes to presidential elections. The word rust itself comes from ludu, meaning redness, as rusty things go a shade of red. A belt that has a name unlike any other is the Stroke Belt, which is a group of 11 states in the southeast. This name comes from the rather morbid fact that the risk of strokes is higher here in these states than any other place in the nation. In fact, these states have an 18% higher stroke incident rate than the national average. The exact reason as to why strokes are more present here specifically doesn't seem to be known. It may be because people who live here do more things that affect strokes like smoke and be obese, but I also read it may be due to factors like the population density or climate. I guess if you happen to be here, just be extra safe. And finally, we have the Unchurched Belt, which is something of an opposite to the Bible Belt we mentioned near the start of this video. This is an area in the northwest of the United States and even into Alaska. They have the lowest rate of church attendances and other religious practices. You may be thinking unchurched is an odd word, and I did too as is the first time I've ever heard it. Why not call it something like the Atheist Belt instead? And I read that being described as unchurched doesn't mean you aren't religious, but more means you just don't go to church. You can still be religious in some way, but just simply not go to church. So maybe that's how the people of this unchurched belt feel, though maybe not. I don't want to speak on behalf of the entire belt of a people. So that seems to be all the belts of the United States of America, but as you saw from this video, some belts come and go, and perhaps there'll be new belts appearing in the future as the USA changes. I would love to know what belt you're watching this video from, and what belts do you think will come into existence in the future? Perhaps if there's enough name explained viewers close enough together, we could form our very own etymology belt. Hey, if I can't have a whole nation, I'll settle for a belt. Now, I know what you're all thinking. Patrick, haven't you already made this video? And the short answer is no. New York City, however, is a city we're very familiar with here on Name Explain. So far, we've looked into where the name New York itself comes from and its previous name in New Amsterdam, as well as the most popular nickname of the Big Apple, and how its five boroughs got their names, all in one video. However, since that video, we went on to look into how the city's most iconic landmark got her name, as well as a separate video looking into how some of the neighborhoods of New York got their names too. You'd think by now we'll be done with the city that never sleeps, right? Well, it's time to take a bite out that Big Apple once again, and it's easy to understand as to why there are so many famous names from this city. It's simply because of how famous New York City has become. In fact, I believe it's the single most iconic city on earth. If you ask someone to name a city, there's a high chance NYC is what they would say, and due to this popularity, it means that anything from this city is instantly iconic. I mean, their bloody fire department has merchandise. I don't think this is a worldwide phenomenon. I've never seen anyone wearing a t-shirt for the Staffordshire Fire and Rescue Service. And no offence to any firefighters from Staffordshire watching, I'm sure you're doing a great Great job and that merch deal will come soon enough. So what part of NYC shall we be looking into today? Well, I'm sure you already know from the title of this video, but of course, the streets. New York City unsurprisingly has hundreds of streets within its five boroughs, so of course we won't be looking to all of these. But yes, thanks to New York City's iconicness, even its streets have become known throughout the world, thanks to the history and the popular culture that have taken place there. So today, let's look into how some of New York's most iconic and interestingly titled streets got their names. Though again, I can imagine you are thinking to yourself, but Patrick, don't lock the streets in New York have really boring names? And the short answer is yes. Yes indeed. Lots of these streets in New York are simply named after numbers, which in all honesty isn't the most exciting of ways to name things, with a lot of these number streets coming from the Commissioner's Plan of 1811. Though it does serve some purpose, it can really help with navigating this concrete jungle, especially in a time before smartphones. When I was in the city, I didn't get to see any of the sites, I was too busy looking at Google Maps and hoping I wouldn't get lost. In example, if you knew you were on 19th Street and were meeting your friend on 21st Street, you know you'll need to go two streets across to reach your destination. 
However, not all these numbered streets are actually called streets. Instead of being a number followed by the word street, they are often a number followed by the word avenue, e.g. 1st Avenue, 6th Avenue, 10th Avenue, stuff like that. In fact, there is logic behind this. It's not just that some are called avenues and some are called streets. So how do you know when to call a road a street or an avenue? It's simple really. Avenues are the roads that go from south to north and streets are the roads that go from east to west. Well, in all honesty, they don't exactly go north to south and east to west due to the angle that Manhattan Island is at, but nevertheless, this is how it is seen. A lot of tourist maps from Manhattan even have it straightened up so it makes it seem more northern, and the numbers of the avenues are sent from east to west, so you'll find 1st Avenue on the east of Manhattan Island and 12th Avenue on the west, while the street numbers are sent from south to north, with 1st Street being in the south and 228th Street being in the north in the Bronx. Once you understand this system of road naming, it can really help with navigating the city. With simply knowing what street slash avenue you are on, and what street slash avenue you need to get to, you can figure out how many streets you need to go across and how many avenues you need to go up or down, making this metropolis a cakewalk to navigate. They may not be the most fun names but they are helpful, which reminds me of a certain other country and its nomenclature. And these names and the layout of NYC seem especially organised to myself when I compare it to the mess that is the capital city of my nation. Though despite how neat and organised all these streets and avenues may seem, this isn't always the case. If you were asked what avenue lays between 3rd and 5th avenue, I'm sure a lot of us will come to the same conclusion, 4th avenue. However, there is no 4th avenue in New York. York City. Between 3rd and 5th Avenue, we actually have three avenues which don't go by numbered names, but rather go by Lexington Avenue, Park Avenue, and Madison Avenue. Park Avenue was initially called 4th Avenue, however. In the 1830s, the New York Central and Harlem Railroad was built, running down 4th Avenue. The trains that ran on this railway were initially pulled by horses, but soon enough steam locomotives took their place. Though the residents of the city were not happy with this, and soon enough complaints about the steam and the danger it could bring came rolling in. Eventually, part of the rail line was closed and moves underground. Where the train line had once been above ground however was covered with a park, leading to the section of 4th Avenue by the park to be dubbed Park Avenue, and then the entirety of 4th Avenue was also dubbed Park Avenue. Madison Avenue is named after Madison Square, which in turn is named after James Madison, the 4th President of the United States. I really like the fact it's named after Madison. While he isn't one of the more well known presidents, it's cool to see he has left his name in the most popular city on earth, and in turn the most famous arena on earth, Madison Square Garden. Lexington Avenue, however, is named after the Battle of Lexington. The town of Lexington in Massachusetts is known as the site of the first shot of the American Revolutionary War, so I can understand why the most renowned city in the USA would like an avenue named after it. It seems that these two avenues were constructed after the others, so initially it would have been just 3rd, then 4th, then 5th Avenue like the rest of them, but over time 4th was changed to Park and Lexington and Madison were added, leading to the odd situation we have today. Also, just to add a little bit more confusion to the east side of Manhattan, 6th Avenue is technically not actually called that, but is really called the Avenue of the Americas, but it seems no one actually calls it that. One of the most famous streets in the entirety of New York City, and quite possibly the world, is Wall Street. Wall Street is the financial hub of the city. I would show a clip from the Wolf of Wall Street here, but due to the nature of that film, I am pretty sure any clip from it would demonetize this entire video. As well as the actual street called Wall Street, the entire area is somewhat known as Wall Street, and the term Wall Street unto itself has become synonymous with money and trading. Wall Street is towards the south of Manhattan, and the name is believed to refer to an actual wall that was constructed in the area by the Dutch while the city was still New Amsterdam with the purpose of this wall supposedly being to keep the rival British settlers out the city. While the wall may be gone, it has lived on in the name of this street. Another street named after something that is no longer there anymore is Canal Street, too located in Manhattan. In fact, a lot of these are going to be Manhattan based, but I'll make sure to show some love for the other boroughs too. In the early 1800s, a canal was dug up here to help move water into the Hudson. While it helped the growing city where it was no longer needed, the canal was filled in, and Canal Street was built in its place. A street without street or avenue in its name is simply the Bowery. I read however that once upon a time this was called Barrily Lane, but the lane part of this name is no longer present. Dutch speakers may realise that this name sounds similar to the Dutch word for farm, Bolledele, and that's exactly where this name comes from, as this road was used by the Dutch during the New Amsterdam days to go from the city to the farmland on the outskirts of the city. Undoubtedly, the most positive sounding name of any NYC street has to go to Utopia Parkway. Seriously, it sounds like the kind of name you'd see at a section of Disneyland or something. Though the street wasn't 
explained due to how idealistic and perfect it is. This Queen Street is named after the Utopia Land Company, who in 1905 brought the land this street is on. The hope was to build this land into a new community for the Jewish residents of Manhattan's Lower East Side, who wanted to leave there. While this never actually happened, the Utopian name was kept, and I can't blame them, it's a great word. Another part of NYC that sounds like a Disney ride is Brooklyn's Love Lane. This is in the affluent Brooklyn's high parts of the borough. This is a simple one block street and seems to have built a reputation around this name. An article from an 1894 edition of the New York Times talks about how the oldest residents can remember a time when there was a cool shady path leading down Lover's Lane, where plump rosy cheeked Dutch maidens with their sweethearts meandered on summer evenings out through the turnside and down the grassy banks onto the water's edge. So it seems this memory created the name and from the name more memories like this have been created. Why lovers chose this lane to saunter down however I don't know. I'm name explain, not lane explain. Also in Brooklyn Heights we have three streets that have common grounds within their names. They are all named after fruits. These are Pineapple Street, Cranberry Street and Orange Street. These three silly names are in a rather posh area of Brooklyn and it's thought that they once had posher names. But the story goes that one resident named Lady Midga, who was also quite posh herself, grew sick of these pompous names. So in the depths of night she changed the signs of these streets to have fruit names instead and those names have stuck around. Up in the Bronx we have a street name that reflects the Native Americans who too shaped New York City. This street being Mosholu Parkway. This is an Algonquin word which means smooth slash small stones and relates to the nearby brook now called Tibbetts Brook. And down in Staten Island we have Victory Boulevard, a name given to this street in celebration of the victory of the First World War. Though perhaps the most famous street in the entirety of NYC, perhaps more so than Wall Street even, is of course Broadway, the home of theatre in the city that never sleeps. To be on Broadway as a performer means you've made it. This is one of the main roads in Manhattan and it's oldest so it has a lot of importance. In the past this would have been the main road in and out of the city. In fact it still does go beyond NYC and upstate New York itself. So this is why it comes from the Dutch term Bladenven which means a broad road as broad means covers a wide area as this road does. However a fun naming fact I enjoy about Broadway is that in 2019 the intersection between Broadway and West 63rd Street received a new name with that new name being Sesame Street in honour of the 50th anniversary of the television show which is based in New York. Can you tell me how to get, how to get to Sesame Street? Yes, it's uh, between 63rd and Broadway. Finally, I want to end with this street. Now, from looking at this, I'm sure you can see that it has an identical name to a city in Texas. And while they are spelt the same, they aren't pronounced the same. Which, believe me, I found out about in my Neighbourhoods of NYC video. In Texas, we have the city of Houston. While in NYC, we have Houston Street. Though I must wonder, is there any connection between the two? Well, yes and no. Yes, in the fact they are both named after important people, but no in regards to literally everything else. Houston, Texas is named after Sam Houston, third president of the Republic of Texas and military leader during the Texas Revolution of 1836. And Houston Street, NYC is named after William Houston, a congressman whose family had an estate in the city that never sleeps, where this road now lays. On the 4th of July 2020, the United States of America will celebrate Independence Day, and in this year the day would have been celebrated 244 times, meaning that it could be seen that in 2020, the nation of the United States of America will in fact be 244 years old. And while in our measly human years that seems like an incredibly long time, in the grand scheme of countries, that's no time at all. Here's a picture of Arundel Castle, which is somewhat near to where I live. Construction on this castle is believed to have started around 1070 AD which is almost 1,000 years ago. This castle in a village in Sussex is older than the nation that is seen by many as the most powerful nation in the world. You made some terrific stuff, America, but you're a baby. A big strong baby, however. And while the USA may not even be a quarter of a millennium years old yet, that doesn't mean that the land that makes up the Americas all of a sudden rose out the Atlantic 244 years ago, with Washington at all all just ready to get things going. The land has been there for quite some time, putting it mildly. And likewise, it's not like this land was just empty up until 1776. We all know the tales of Columbus and other Europeans quote unquote discovering America and colonizing it. In fact, it's believed the landmass we now call the United States of America had been inhabited for 15,000 years at least. We know for sure people were comfortably living here at that time, so it's easily argued that they were here way before that. Perhaps people were living in the Americas 20, 30, or even 40,000 years ago. Make no mistake, while the USA may be quite young, the Americas, as we call it now, is just as ancient as the rest of the world. 
and these people who were living in this land all this time ago were of course various tribes and groups of people that we now refer to as Native Americans. There are so many Native American related videos I want to make as Native Americans and names just seem to have a deep relationship in history. From the names of various tribes, to the naming traditions that these tribes have within them, to the names outsiders have given them, such as Red Indian and of course the name I've used myself, Native American. I understand this is still a hotly debated issue, and many find the term Native American to be incorrect as these people were natives of America. This is definitely a topic that can have a video onto itself. Apologies if this upsets anyone, please let me know down in the comments if this does and why. I'd love to understand more about the Native American nomenclature conundrum and get an American perspective on the situation. News on this topic doesn't travel across the Atlantic too often. Before Europeans arrived, the Native Americans lived in various tribes across the land who would have been broken up into smaller bands. These tribes and bands would have been nomadic people, meaning instead of having a single homeland, they would be constantly on the move, with tribes moving six to eight times a year. This was because they lived off the land in hunter-gatherer lifestyles, had to follow migrating animals like the buffalo, and they believed that their gods wanted them to live a life of continued movement, and their settlements allowed them to move easily. Native Americans lived in teepees, which could be taken down for movement in minutes. And while they resided in a land that we now call America, they for sure would have not called it that. The name America derives from the name of the Italian explorer Amelago Vespucci. He visited the land too after Columbus, and he was the one who had the idea that the land wasn't part of Asia as Columbus had thought, but rather an entirely new part of the world, so he dubbed it fittingly the New World. Amerigo's ventures into the New World were in 1492, and in 1507, German cartographer Martin Wolitzimoller created a New World map and labelled part of modern day South America as America, in honour of the Italian explorer Amerigo Vespucci. That's the abridged story anyway, I have a whole video going into this story in way more detail. So I'm sure you can understand as to why the Native Americans wouldn't have used this name of America. It's the name that simply didn't exist when the Native Americans were the ones solely on the land, before any Europeans came to the land and thrust this name upon it. So it makes you wonder, if the name America didn't exist for this land when the Native Americans resided solely on it, then what name did they have for the land that we now call America? Well, they kind of did and didn't have a name for the land. Researching into this question brought up a myriad of answers. We must remember that while we often call these people people simply Native Americans and have a set generic image in our minds for them, that couldn't be further from the truth. Doing that would be like simply branding everyone who lives in Europe as just European, with no other specific titles like French or English. As of right now, the USA recognises 475 different tribes. This includes the likes of the more well-known tribes like the Cherokee, Navajo, Sioux and various Apache tribes. All these tribes have a variety of different cultures, traditions and languages, which we'll talk about more in a moment. It's unknown how much these various tribes would have known about each other. I read that at most a tribe would have known about the tribes nearest to them, and they could have been friendly and traded with them, or even seen them as a threat. As for further afield tribes, it's tough to say. They may not have known that these other tribes even existed, or that the land they lived on was even there. Also, as we mentioned, these tribes would have been nomadic, so it could be argued that they wouldn't have named the land as they wouldn't have had enough time to get attached to it and consider it a home before they were on the move again. It's said that because they wouldn't have had a geographical grasp of the land they were on as a whole, the fact they lived in various somewhat insular tribes, and due to their nomadic lifestyle, they simply wouldn't have had an all-encompassing name for what we now call America. They wouldn't have had any kind of concept of nations as we do right now, or even continents. Many of us see the Americas as two different continents, North America and South America, and of course all this time there would have been natives in what we call today North America and South America, and these people would have interacted, but a tribe from modern North America interacting with a tribe from modern Modern South America wouldn't mean any different than two different North American tribes interacting with one another. And of course there's the language issue. There are hundreds of different Native American languages that various tribes speak and would have spoke, and these languages would have had their own words for things like land and earth. In example, the Navajo word for land is Kia. Words like this could be seen as a Native American name for America, as it technically is a noun used to refer to the land that we would now call America. However, it would be kind of boring if I ended this video here by saying that no, they didn't have any names for the land. And luckily for us, we can delve into the history books and find some names that were bestowed upon the land by tribes from both modern day North and South America. I mean, this does make sense. Naming things is a basic human enjoyment, I feel, and it would have been impossible to simply not give a title to the land you're on. At least I think so anyway. Though a lot of these names may have only initially referred to a part of the landmass of modern day America. While it would have been all the land to them, we now know it was just a small part of the land. Though it seems some of these names have retracted 
effectively become used to refer to the entirety of North or South America, or the entirety of the Americas. Though what's interesting about a lot of these names is they don't derive from the traditional roots we see so often here on the channel. It's not like these names come from geographical landmarks or the name of a tribe, but instead it comes from the mythology or lore of various Native American tribes, and some of them tend to be representations of the land that have a name, as opposed to a name for the land itself. That may sound a wee bit confusing, so it may make more sense when I talk about one of these names. In fact, it seems to be the most popular idea as to what the Native Americans called America, and that's with the name Mikinokawaju, which is a name used by a variety of tribes, including the Lenape and Iroquois, and this name translates into English as Turtle Island. Many tribes have stories about Turtle Island, and the idea is that our world is actually on the back of a giant turtle that's swimming through an endless ocean. Some even believe that North America looks like a turtle unto itself. The full story of Turtle Island varies from tribe to tribe, but a popular story is that the Great Spirit flooded the earth due to feuding people in hopes that life could start again anew. Some animals survived this flooding however, including the loon, the muskrat and of course the turtle. A life spirit named Nanabush survived too. Nanabush asked the surviving animals to dive deep into the flooded world to collect soil so he could create a new world. The loon initially failed, but when the muskrat tried, he reached the soil, but unfortunately died before he could make it back to the waters surface. Though he had soil in his hands, his death was not for nothing however, as Nanabush took this soil, placed it on the turtle's back and created life there. Thus the myth of the turtle island was born. Turtles with planets on their back appear in mythologies all around the world, and even in some fictions too. Another tale somewhat like this is from the Maya mythology with the name Zipakna. Once again, this isn't so much a name for the land, but the name for a mythological creature that became the land. In Maya mythology, Zipakna is the mountain god, and is often portrayed as a huge crocodile-like beast. I've also read that it's a personification of the earth's crust, which is why the earth can be so rugged, much like a crocodile's skin, and the spikes on his back became the mountains we have on our planet. So I'm sure you can understand as to why we could see this to as being a name for the Americas, as some of them believe their land was no more than the shell of a turtle or the skin of a crocodile. There is another mythological character who is seen as a personification of the land too, but this one is a little less reptilian. That is with Pachamama. She derived from the Inca and other tribes from the Andes in South America. She is seen as looking after nature and natural disasters are seen as her punishing the humans for when they abuse the land too much. While she is from South American mythology, I have seen people using her to refer to North America too. You have probably noticed that the word Mama resides within her name, and that's because she is something of a Mother Earth character. In fact, her name translates to mean world mother. A popular Native American name for the Americas that doesn't arrive from mythology is Abiyayala. This name comes from the Kuna people, who are indigenous to North and South America, specifically the modern countries of Panama and Colombia. Because it crosses over the North America South America divide that has been constructed, the name is seen being somewhat all encompassing for the Americas, and so has become a name for the land that Native Americans use for America. The name is thought to be able to translate into two different meanings. It either means land in its full maturity or land of vital blood. And finally we have the Aztec term for their world, which at its peak covered the large area of Central America. The word they used to refer to their land was Simenahuac. This name for the land means land surrounded by water, and from looking at where the Aztecs resided this really makes sense. Central America is slim and the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans are easily accessible from it, and the Aztecs knew about these oceans. However, they did not know that the land carried on for a great length into North and South America, so to them it was just land surrounded by water. We have tackled questions like this in the past, where we've asked what the ancient Egyptians called Egypt and what the Celts would have called ancient Britain. In those scenarios, we were fortunate enough to arrive at some pretty concrete answers to those questions, and while we don't have one solid answer to what the Native Americans called America, we instead have a selection of different names for what different tribes and groups of people called their different parts of the Americas. The Americas and the United States in particular are known for their diversity and it's amazing to see that diversity going this far back in time with the many names the many people had for this land. The city of the United States is of course Washington DC, named in honor of the nation's very first president. George Washington. The DC part of this name means District of Columbia, named in honor of Christopher Columbus, and the city of Washington has this at the end of its name as a unique district unto itself, and not really a part of any of the states. However, Washington DC isn't the only capital city in this nation. The United States of America is a series of states that united in America. 
You probably didn't need me to explain that one. And each of these 50 states actually have their own capital city, and these are known as state capitals. What I find most interesting about these state capitals is that a lot of them probably aren't the city you think they're going to be. Well, if you're an uneducated person like I am anyway, most states have a city they're most well known for outside of that state. Say the likes of New York City in New York State, Los Angeles in California, Miami in Florida, and Philadelphia in Pennsylvania. However, none of these cities I just mentioned are actually their state capitals. Capitals. What are their capitals? Well, carry on watching and find out. So let's take a whistle stop tour of the land of the free and find out how all 50 of these state capitals got their names. This will be an alphabetical order of the state names and we have a lot to get through, so these are going to be very brief explanations. However, I'm not opposed to covering some of these names in more detail in the future in videos unto themselves, and I've actually already covered some in more detail. If you've seen the Capitals of Europe video, you should have a good idea how this video will play out. And also, yes, I know I haven't made a video about how all 50 states got their names yet. I know many of you want to see it, it's quite possibly my most requested video, and because of that I'm saving it for when we finally hit our main goal of a thousand dollars a month from Patreon, so if you want to see that video then why not consider supporting there? Just one dollar a month supports the channel in a huge way, gets you extra name and spam awards, and gets us closer to seeing that video. Now however, let's look into those state capitals, starting with Montgomery, the state capital of Alabama. This city was named in honour of General Richard Montgomery, a figure who became a war hero in the American Revolution war. While Alaska's capital of Juneau comes from the name of a Canadian prospector, Joe Juneau, who discovered gold in the area and persuaded fellow miners with drinks and money to name the area after him. While Phoenix, Arizona is named after the mythical Phoenix, a creature known for rising again from its own ashes, as this city was built on the site where an older settlement once stood. Arkansas's capital of Little Rock is named after a small rock formation by the Arkansas River. This name was initially coined by a Frenchman, so it was originally Le Petit Loche. California's capital is actually Sacramento. This city is named after the Sacramento River, and Sacramento is the Spanish word for sacrament, as in the Holy Sacrament of Christianity. While Denver, Colorado was named after Governor James Denver by General William H. Laramere, who named it after him in the hopes of getting in the governor's good books. Hartford, Connecticut was named in honour of the English town of Hartford in Hertfordshire. Named in honour of this town as the city's founder, Reverend Thomas Hooker had an assistant from this English town. Delaware state capital of Dover is too named after somewhere in England, that being Dover in Kent. And the state capital of Florida is Tallahassee, which isn't named after a place in England but is believed to come from Native American roots, and it's thought to mean old rancid tribal town. Atlanta, Georgia was named by railroad engineer J. Edgar Thompson, and he even named it after the Western Atlantic Railroad, the city served as a terminus for, or after the middle name of a local governor's daughter, Martha Atalanta Lumpkin. Honolulu is the capital of the newest state, Hawaii, and the island state has its own language, Hawaiian, and in this language, Honolulu means either sheltered harbour or calm port. Idaho's capital of Boise has a name of French origin, with this name meaning wooded in French, as 19th century French hunters would trek down its heavily wooded river, which they called the Boise River. Springfield is a popular settlement name in the USA, and the Illinois capital has this name too. The name derives from the nearby Spring Creek River. Indiana's capital is Indianapolis, creatively named after the state it is in, with the Greek polis suffix meaning city. Iowa's Des Moines, however, has multiple theories as to where the name came from. It was initially Fort Des Moines, but the fort part was dropped. The name is thought to either be a French corruption of the Algonquin name for the river by it, Moingona. It could possibly come from French meaning the middle, as it's between the Missouri and Mississippi River or it may come from the Moine de la Trappe monks who lived in the area. Kansas's Topeka is too not entirely known. It apparently either means Smoky Hill or a good place to dig potatoes. Frankfurt in Kentucky is actually a corruption of Frank's Ford, named in honour of frontiersman Stephen Frank, who died at a river's ford in this area. Baton Rouge in Louisiana comes from French too, unsurprisingly. And if you know your French, you'll know this means red stick. The initial red stick of Baton Rouge was apparently a tall red pole adorned with fish bones, the natives put up to signify the end of their land. The name in Maine that we need to explain is Augusta. This name comes from the daughter of Revolutionary War General Henry Dearborn, with her name being Pamela Augusta. Another state capital named after a woman is Annapolis in Maryland. This city is named after Queen Anne of Great Britain, and once again we see the Greek polis suffix meaning city. And Boston, Massachusetts is named after Boston, Lincolnshire in England. Michigan's capital of Lansing was initially just called Michigan too. How this name 
name was changed to honor John Lansing Jr., a notable statesman from New York. St. Paul, Minnesota was of course named after St. Paul of Christianity, and Jackson, Mississippi was named after American soldier slash statesman slash president Andrew Jackson. Missouri Jefferson City is named after President too, that being Thomas Jefferson. Helena in Montana is reportedly named after a variety of things. I've read it was named after a town called St. Helena in Minnesota, the island of St. Helena, or that a miner called it Helena due to a woman he loved having that name too. And with Lincoln in Nebraska, we have another capital named after a president, this of course being Abraham Lincoln. Carson City in Nevada is named after famed frontiersman Christopher Carson. New Hampshire's Concord has a name that came from a land dispute in the area. Once this land dispute was settled, the city was named Concord, as this word means an agreement slash harmony between people. New Jersey's capital is Trenton, and this name came from a corruption of its original name of Trent Town. This name came from William Trent, who was a key landholder during the formation of this city. New Mexico's capital has a name from Spanish, with it being called Santa Fe, with this name meaning holy faith in Spanish. The Spanish settlers in the New World gave a lot of their settlements religious names. New York State has the city of Albany as its state capital. This name came when the British took over the land from the Dutch and named it in honour of their Duke of Albany, with Albany being an old name for Northern Scotland, and Raleigh in North Carolina is named after none other than Sir Walter Raleigh. Bismarck in North Dakota has a very German sounding name, and that's because it was renamed this in 1873 in honour of Otto von Bismarck in hope to attract German investors into the city for their railway. Columbus, Ohio is named after you know who, and Oklahoma's Oklahoma City is named after the state it's in. Salem, Oregon, not that Salem, is thought to mean place of rest in a native language. Harrisburg in Pennsylvania is named after a father-son duo, both called John Harris. Father John Harris settled the site initially, and son John Harris laid out the city. Rhode Island's Providence has a religious meaning too, as this word means God's protective care. It has this name as it was named by settler slash minister Roger Williams. South Carolina once again has a capital named after you know who as it's called Columbia. South Dakota's capital Pier was named after fur trader Pierre Chotu Jr. Nashville, Tennessee was also named after someone, with that someone being General Francis Nash. Texas's capital is Austin, and this is named after Texas's most famous Austin, Stephen F. Austin. No, that isn't the Texan Austin I had in mind either. Utah's Salt Lake City is named after the Great Salt Lake, which is near to the city. Montpelier in Vermont is obviously a French name too, and this Montpelier is named after the city of Montpelier in France. Richmond, Virginia supposedly has a view to thank for its name. The story goes that a man named William Budd II named the town after the town of Richmond in England, as the view of the river here reminded him of the view of the Thames from Richmond Hill. So the name was applied to this US city. Richmond in England is now actually part of London. Washington State's capital of Olympia is named this due to the view of the Olympic mountains that could be seen in the city on a clear day. West Virginia's Charleston was developed by Colonel George Clondenow, who named it after his father, Charles. This name was initially Charles's town, but eventually got corrupted into Charleston. Madison, Wisconsin is named after President James Madison. And finally we have Wyoming and their state capital of Cheyenne, which is named after the Native Americans of the same name. And apparently this name for these people comes from French Canadian and means speak incoherently, which I imagine comes from the fact that the French Canadians were unable to speak the language of these people. And there you have it, how all 50 state capitals got their names. What I found most interesting about these names is the variety of origins. We have cities named after important people, cities named after places in other parts of the world, cities named after Native American words, and even a couple of cities that were named in the hopes they would get on someone's good side. The United States of America is exactly that, United States, but each of these states have their own identity and history, and this can be seen perfectly in the names of the capitals of these states. Hey, have you ever wondered where the word news comes from, as in the kind of information you read in papers and see on the television? Well, we actually have two ideas as to where it comes from. Both of these ideas is that news is an acronym. One idea is as an acronym of North, East, West, South, because news comes from all over the land. And the other idea is as an acronym of notable events, weather and sports, as those are the key topics usually covered in the news. Though which one of these is the actual true origins of the word news? It has to be one of them, right? Well, no, neither of them are true. Both of these are purposefully made up ideas as to where the word news came from. This is something known as folk etymology. 
Folk etymology is when an idea for a word's origin seemingly sprouts out of nowhere with little to no evidence and gains traction. A lot of the time these folk etymologies become more well known than the word's actual origins and get passed along from person to person without any clue that they are spreading information that simply isn't accurate. To start with these spread from people actually speaking to one another but of course they would spread through written and spoken sources too and in more recent times they are spread online through social media sharing. It's a very good time in history to be a folk etymology right now. The term folk etymology was coined in 1852 by German historian, mathematician and linguist Ernst Fustermann. As he was German, the word was German initially too, being Fuchst etymology. It was then translated into English to become folk etymology. I imagine this name was chosen for these untrue word origins as folk has become something of an adjective meaning having unknown origins, like we see with folk tale, folklore and folk hero. And to me, folk etymologies conjure up the same sort of feeling and ideas that folk tales do too. Folk etymologies come about through all kinds of means. A lot of the time we don't know where exactly they come from. That's what makes them so troubling. However, sometimes we have more evidence as to where they come from. Words are given back formations, have acronyms applied to them, or are claimed to be named in someone's honour. Or people just come to logical conclusions based on the word themselves. A great example is with hamburger. A lot of people presume that because hamburgers are a meat-based food, and ham is a name for a kind of meat, then the name must come from there. However, hamburger's name has nothing to do with a pig's meat, but relates to the German city of Hamburg. A lot of the time folk etymology is people simply filling in the gaps in information for themselves. Folk etymologies remain popular because, in all honesty, they're just pretty fun. Folk etymologies are a pretty neat, compact, fun, shareable story that makes you go, huh, that is interesting. In fact, they're usually so interesting and neat that you feel compelled to share them with other people, thus perpetuating the false narrative. Real etymologies, unfortunately, aren't that fun. A lot of words come from ancient, murky, unknown origins. Trust me, if all etymologies were as fun as folk etymologies, I'd be way more successful. Take the actual etymology of news. It comes from the adjective of new as news tends to be new events. This adjective came into English through old words of Germanic origin, like the Middle Dutch new and the Gothic neus, ultimately coming from the Proto-Indo-European newor, but unknown beyond that. Like I said, this is nowhere near as fun as the folk etymology. No one is sharing that fact with their mates at the pub, or tweeting it with a shocked emoji in hopes to get retweet. It's a pretty boring piece of information and the folk etymology is way more fun. And in all honesty, I really like folk etymologies. I know that might seem odd, in fact this whole video concept might seem strange. Name explains a channel all about finding the true origins of words, so a video focusing on fake etymologies might seem like a slap in the face. That's why we should only talk about folk etymology, as long as we iterate that these ideas or word origins aren't real and explain why they aren't real. Folk etymology however is a pretty big feature in language and does have linguistic importance in its own right. Folk etymology shows us just how creative people can be with language. The understanding people have of things like acronyms, back formation and eponyms to fill in the gaps of word origins. While folk etymologies aren't true, it's hard to argue that they aren't creative. And creativity in language is something that separates us from the rest of the animal world. I'd really recommend the book Word Myths by David Wilton if what I spoke about so far interests you. And it's from this book that I found out about the main folk etymologies I want to share with you all today. If you happen to be watching in the future, this video went live on the 3rd of July 2020, just one day before the 244th Independence of the United States of America. And to celebrate this fact, I want to share two popular folk etymologies that are attached to the name America. And of course, most importantly, explain why we know these etymologies aren't true. Before we talk about the folk etymologies however, do we know the actual true origins of the name America? Well yes, I actually made a whole video about the name many years ago but let's have a quick recap of the facts before we step into the fiction. This name came about way before the USA was a thing as remember while this nation is known as America, so is the entire landmass it is on that contains not only the USA but also Canada, Mexico, Brazil, Peru, Honduras etc. This land is called the Americas and is usually split between the two continents of North and South America. The nation of the USA contains the word America because it's a series of states that are united on the landmass of America. The landmass of the Americas has the Italian explorer Amelio Vespucci to thank for its name. But why him exactly? When you think of people pivotal to the history of the Americas, I'm sure other names come to mind first. In example, Columbus. He names so much of this part of the world, and so much of this part of the world is named after him. Why not name the entire thing Columbus? Well, while Christopher Columbus arrived in the land before Lamelago in 1492, he famously thought he had found another faster route to Asia. Amelio Vespucci made two trips to the land after Columbus 
Nicholas, first in 1499 and again in 1501. It was a few years later in some letters he published that put forward a radical new idea that flew in the face of Columbus. Amerigo Vespucci hypothesized that the land Columbus quote unquote discovered was not a part of Asia, but rather entirely new land undiscovered by Europeans until then. And over time it was discovered that Vespucci was correct in his idea, and the land was his own continent and not a part of Asia. He dubbed this new land Novus Mundus, meaning New World. And of course the New World is a name the Americas did slash still do kind of go by, and this name of New World was coined by Amerigo. So he did name the land, but not after himself. It wouldn't be till 1507 that the land would be named after him. It was in this year that German cartographer Martin Waldseemoller published a brand new world map which showed the new world as a separate entity. However, he also labelled this part of the world as America in honour of Amerigo Vespucci. And from here, the name has stuck around. This is the origin accepted by pretty much everyone, though as I said there are other theories. One of these were perpetuated by French geologist Jules Maku. He became convinced that the name America came from the Amerikou people and the Amerikou mountains in Nicaragua in Central America. Maku argued that Columbus had met these people and seen these mountains on his fall visit to the land and took this name back to Europe with him. It sounds pretty convincing, right? Americu does sound an awful lot like America, and Columbus did visit and interact with these people. It makes all the sense in the world for this land to be named after people who live there, or a geographical feature like mountains, as many places are named after these things. Yet it simply isn't the case, and we believe this for a few reasons. First, we have no record of Columbus bringing this name back with him, and we have no proof of Columbus using the name Americu or anything like it. Also, the name Americu only came into use in Europe in 1874, just a year prior to Marco publishing his theory, and over 300 years after Vadzi Muller's map came out. It was first seen in Europe on a map by English scientist Thomas Belt, who labelled that part of Nicaragua as Amelicu. Belt didn't coin this word, it's of unknown native origins. Marku saw this map and ran with his theory. Years later, Belt even wrote to Marku and explained that he believed that the names of America and the Amelicu sounding similar is nothing more than a coincidence, and in all honesty, most people believe this too. Coincidences might seem boring, but sometimes that really is the case. Argue even to put forward that with the amount of native languages in the land at the time, it was inevitable that one of the words would sound like America. And other theories are that the spelling and pronunciation of Americu was influenced by Europe to sound more like America after that name had already been coined. While that's that etymology debunked, there is a second theory, and that is that it comes from the surname of a Bristolian merchant of the 15th century, Richard Emeric, whose surname you also find spelled like this too. What did Richard have to do with America? Well, we aren't exactly sure, but he seems to have played a role in the 1497 and 1498 voyages of John Cabot, the Italian who's seen as being the quote-unquote discoverer of North America. In these expeditions, it's thought America had something to do with finances, as the evidence we have of him is from him signing Cabot's pension payment. This theory gained traction in 1908 thanks to Bristol historian Alfred E. Hudd. His primary evidence is a city record dating back to 1497, talking about Cabot's journey and calling the land America. This was in 1497, and Vespucci visited the land for the first time in 1499, and it was named after him in 1507, so this was way before Amerigo visited America. And as this voyage included some of the name Americ and called the land America, Hudd put two and two together and theorised that this could be where the name actually comes from, as it predates Vespucci's voyages and Valti Muller's map. However, it doesn't actually predate Vespucci's voyages or Valti Muller's map. The 1496 city record Hud pointed to as evidence had been lost and Hud was actually using a record from 1564 that summarised the lost 1497 record. By 1565, America was a commonly used name for the New World, so in summarising the 1497 record, the name was retroactively used, hence what it seemed like the name America was in use before Amerigo's travels. And just to add to this, that 1565 record was destroyed in a 1565 fire, so the evidence that America was named after Richard Americ comes from an old lost document that talked about an even older lost document. I'm sure you can see why this etymology is so thoroughly debunked, despite how plausible it seems. Once again, America and Americ sounding similar is just a big old coincidence. So it seems pretty conclusive that America is named after Amerigo Vespucci, but nevertheless these folk etymologies about the Amerigo people slash mountains and Richard Americ are pretty fun stories, despite the fact they aren't true. As I said, I do really enjoy folk etymologies, they're fun to look at and see how human brains have come to somewhat logical conclusions for word origins. However, like I also said, when we talk about folk etymologies, we must emphasise that this is a folk etymology, and not mistake it for the truth and spread misinformation. Sometimes folk etymologies are 
hard to detect, so always have your wits about you when hearing any information you might find suspicious, especially from tools like myself blabbering away on the internet. I'm not a valid source of information, but my sources hopefully are. We live in a time where false information is more rife than ever, and sometimes there can even be false information in our etymologies. There have been 45 presidents of the United States of America. Well, it's actually 44 different people, as a certain someone had to have two non-consecutive terms, but you get the idea. And while all these people have held the same position of office, there have been differences between each of their tenures as commander-in-chief. This could be in relation to how much land they actually ruled over, how long their time as president actually was, or simply how much power they could wield due to other factors in the US political system, such as the House of Representatives and the Senate. It's factors like these that can affect a president's legacy. I'm sure all US presidents have wanted to leave some form of legacy on the nation after their time in the White House has come to an end. And for better or worse, all these presidents have created a legacy. And like their time in office as mentioned, not all these legacies are equal. A president like Millard Fillmore, whoever on earth he is, isn't as well remembered as say a president like Abraham Lincoln. And a great way to judge a person's legacy is of course with names. Gosh, who thought I was going to say that? Name explain talking about names. Shocking, I know. If someone's legacy legacy is great enough, then it's more than likely that places and things will start to get named after them. Just think how many streets are named after Martin Luther King Jr. And of course, US presidents are no exception to this rule. Many places across the United States and the world in fact are named after presidents. But is there at least one place named after every US president? That's our aim for today. And what I find fun about this concept is by seeing what places are named after these people. We can get a good understanding into what kind of legacy they have left. Some left a big enough legacy to have entire cities and states named after them, and some just got a school or street. I am sure many of you will easily be able to name a place named after George Washington, but can you name somewhere named after Paul Millard Fillmore? And just as a ground rule, what exactly am I counting as a place? In my eyes, this is a physical location you can stand on slash in. If someone were to ask you where you are, it wouldn't sound weird if you said you were there. It's places we are looking for named after presidents, not just things as a whole. Like like, while teddy bears are named after Theodore Roosevelt, a teddy bear isn't a place. If you told someone that your current location is simply teddy bear, they might think you're a tad strange. I'm sure you clearly understand what I mean, but I like to set these sort of rules for myself. So let's go in chronological order, shall we? Starting with George Washington. He is perhaps the president with the most places named after him. Most noticeably, of course, we have Washington DC, the capital of the USA, and Washington State up in the Pacific Northwest of the nation. Washington was followed by John Adams? I know him. For Adams we have the John Adams Building, one of the oldest buildings of the Library of Congress. Thomas Jefferson came next and he is considered one of the most important presidents in the nation's history. I know this because he's one of the big faces on that mountain. And while there are many places named after him, I'm going to share the example of Jefferson Rock, a rock formation in West Virginia. It was named after him as it actually stood at this very rock in 1783 and described its view as worth the voyage across the Atlantic. James Madison next, and his name was used in the creation of Madison Square slash Madison Square Park in New York City, most noticeably for being in the shadow of the famous Flatiron Building. And of course, it went on to lend its name to the famous Madison Square Garden Arena. The original arena was near the park, but newer versions have since moved further away, but the name stuck around. If we go north of New York City into the state of Connecticut, we find the town of Monroe, which is named after the fifth president of the USA. James Monroe. The sixth US president was John Quincy Adams, and there's a reason that name sounds familiar. He was the son of the second president, who was also called John Adams. Many of the things I found to be named after the first Adams are also named after Quincy Adams too, and the Adams family in general. Places like Adams House at Harvard University are named after both these Adams in example. You may think that the city of Quincy in Massachusetts was named specifically after the sixth president, but this city was actually named after Colonel John Quincy, who was the great-grandfather of John Quincy Adams, and in turn, he was named after him. Andrew Jackson seems to have quite a few places named after him. The most noticeable it seems to be in Jacksonville, Florida. He played a role in the Seminole War, which led to Florida becoming part of the USA. Martin Van Buren has a whole island named after himself. While that might sound impressive, it's actually pretty small, and funnily enough, it's actually technically in Canada. I actually found the listing for the island for sale, but unfortunately it's sold 
old now. And as for William Henry Harrison, we have Harrison, Ohio, a small city named after the president. Tyler County down in Texas is named of course after John Tyler, the 10th US president. Polk is a rather pleasant name to say, and it's the surname of a Mr. James K. Polk. And many places are named after this guy too. The one I like the sound of most however, has to be Polkton Township in Michigan. Zachary Taylor has an entire state park named after him, that being Fort Zachary Taylor Historic State Park, which definitely isn't a mouthful. This state park is in Florida, but more specifically, it's almost at the southern tip of the Florida Keys, making it one of the southernmost points of the USA, which I found of interest, but maybe that's just me. Then we reach Millard Fillmore, the president I spent the first part of this video mocking for not being known. But that doesn't just seem to be me, as I found an article literally called, What's the Deal with Millard Fillmore? So apologies to any strong Fillmoreites, but you seem to be outnumbered. However, he seems to be popular in Utah, as this article explains they have Millard County, and its seat is called Fillmore. So even poor old Millard Fillmore. So even poor old Millard Fillmore, who I've ridiculed has somewhere named after him. But surely Franklin Pierce doesn't have anywhere named after him, right? Well, once again, we have Pierce in Indiana, a tiny town which looks almost like it's from a movie set that Wikipedia claims has just over 1,000 residents is named after this guy. And as for James Buchanan, we have a county in Iowa named after him. Then we have the big guy, quite literally from all accounts, Abraham Lincoln. He is one of the most well-known presidents of the United States, and many places are named after him, so we have a huge selection to choose from. I'm going to go with how of the state capital of Nebraska called Lincoln, because this was the first place to be named after him after his death. Originally the city was called Lancaster, but renamed shortly after his assassination. And after that untimely death, Andrew Johnson took over, and he seems to be one of the more disliked presidents in US history. However, I did find the Andrew Johnson building in Knoxville, Tennessee, and following him, we had the awesomely named named Ulysses S. Grant as president. Despite this cool name, not too many places are seemingly named after him, though I did find Grant Square in Brooklyn. For President Rutherford B. Hayes, we are actually leaving the USA and going to Paraguay of all places, as here we have Presidente Hayes Department, named after him due to the fact he arbitrated a dispute between the nation and Argentina. Following Hayes, we had James A. Garfield, who like Lincoln was assassinated. This led to the James A. Garfield Memorial being named after him, which makes all the sense in the world as it was a memorial to his death. Though one of the strangest entries on this list has the Chester A. Arthur, his house is now known as the Chester A. Arthur Home, so it is named after him. However, it has since been overtaken by a shop that sells Indian and Middle Eastern spices and food, which is crazy considering not only did he live here, but he was even inaugurated here. Next up we have Grover Cleveland. This president has a volcano named after him, Mount Cleveland in Alaska to be exact, and it seems to be rather active. Benjamin Harrison has not gone down in the history books as a well-known president, but we do have Harrison Hall in at Purdue University named after him, and following Harrison was Grover Cleveland again. Yep, this guy had two non-consecutive terms as president, so he's the 22nd and 24th, which really throws a spanner in the works. Instead of sharing somewhere else named after him, I'll let you know somewhere not named after him, that being Cleveland, Ohio. Despite the identical names, the city is named after its founder, Moses Cleveland, so it's just a coincidence. Also assassinated was William McKinley, so things have been named after him too, including this school in Columbus, Indiana. This meant his vice president, had to take over, and that was none other than Theodore Roosevelt, another beloved president. As a lover of the nation's nature, it's only fitting we have a national park named after him, that being Theodore Roosevelt National Park in North Dakota. His successor however, William Howard Taft, doesn't have quite the legacy, though we do have Taft High School in Chicago, so there's something. President Woodrow Wilson has a bridge of all things named after him. Woodrow Wilson Bridge crosses the Potomac River and crosses state borders between Virginia and Maryland. Warren G. Harden doesn't have the best reputation either it would seem, so it's perhaps somewhat fitting that an ice field in Alaska bears his name. Calvin Coolidge on the other hand has a city in Arizona named after him, which is better than an ice field that's for sure. 
Herbert Hoover, of course, has the famous Hoover Dam named after him, which was initially called Boulder Dam. And next up, we have the longest reigning president ever, FDR, Franklin D. Roosevelt. As he is so popular, he has a whole island named in his honor. This island is part of NYC, meaning it is actually a part of the USA, unlike Van Buren's island. Harry S. Truman has the Harry S. Truman Building named after him, which is in Washington, D.C., and is the HQ of the United States Department of State. Eight. Dwight D. Eisenhower has perhaps the biggest thing named after him, that being the Dwight D. Eisenhower Interstate Highway System, which spans the entire mainland of the nation. I guess this is kind of a geographic location, though the actual roads have names unto themselves I suppose. John F. Kennedy of course has JFK Airport named after him, situated in New York City, it's perhaps the city's main airport, well it's the one I used anyway. And after his assassination, Lyndon B. Johnson stepped up to be president, and we have somewhere on the other side of the world named after him, the LBJ Tropical Medical Center in American Samoa. Following this Johnson is perhaps the most divisive US president, Richard Nixon. It seems like quite the feat to find somewhere named after this guy, due to his unpopularity. One article goes on a quest to find places named after him. It seems there are little more than a few roads, schools, and a library in Hong Kong of all places had his name too. His resignation made way for Gerald Ford. Like JFK, he has an airport named after him too, Gerald R. Ford International Airport in Michigan. A smaller airport airport is named after Jimmy Carter too, that being Jimmy Carter Regional Airport in Georgia. A reason why there probably isn't more named after him is because he's still alive, and naming usually starts after death. Next we had Ronald Reagan, a very popular president with many places named after him it would seem, from schools to streets to roads. Even across the world in Poland we have Ronald Reagan Park. The first of two Bushes is George H.W. Bush, and in Texas we have George Bush Intercontinental Airport, and further afield we have Bill Clinton Boulevard, in Kosovo of all places, named this due to the support he gave the land in their continued struggle for independence. Next we have the second Bush, George W. Bush. Like with Carter, as he is still alive, there's less named after him. With George W. Bush Elementary School in Texas though. And also still alive is Barack Obama, who despite this has loads of places named after him. Oddly enough though, there's Barack Obama Plaza, which is a really fancy name for a motorway service area in Ireland of all places. Named due to Obama having old family ties to this part of the world. And then we have Donald Trump the current president of the United States. Despite being alive and currently in power, he actually too has loads of places named after him, from Trump Tower to Trump Golf Courses to Trump Plazas. The only difference here is that he named these places after himself. I will let you decide what to make of that. And that is at least one place named after every president of the United States. However, things are changing, and just recently we found out who the next president will be. Joe Biden. What kind of legacy will he leave in the White House, and what kind of places will be named after him once he is president of the United States of America? Demonym is a specific type of noun that identifies a group of people based on the part of the world they are from. I am pretty sure everyone can have a demonym applied to them and they are words we use on an incredibly regular basis. Think of words like Mexican or Icelander. They are important words, don't get me wrong, but they can be pretty darn boring at times. So boring in fact that sometimes we forego using these words, instead use a nickname that nationality has acquired. A lot of the time these national nicknames are just diminutive forms of their proper names. Think Brits instead of British or Aussie instead of Australian. Sometimes however they can be a bit more unique. Think of the likes of Kiwi for someone from New Zealand, Canuck for someone from Canada, or Tico slash Tika for someone from Costa Rica. Sometimes these nicknames even surpass the official demonym in usage. Like have you ever heard someone from New Zealand actually be called a New Zealander instead of a Kiwi? It's one particular national nickname we are looking into today, that being the nickname for people from the third most populated country on our planet, the United States of America, and their nickname of Yankee. Thank you.
And I can already hear people getting angry at me for that previous comment, as I implied that Yankee is a nickname that can be applied to all citizens of the United States of America, and that doesn't seem to be the case. From what I've read online, it seems that people from outside the state use Yankee to refer to any American from any part of the state. However, within the nation, things get a bit more pedantic. Many Americans see Yankee as a name for just those in the north of the United States, the north in this case being the wider northeast area, not the Pacific Northwest or the more western border states, while some specify to more just the New England region of the nation. Some go as far as saying Yankee is a name that should only be applied to people from the state of Vermont. Nevertheless, it seems there's quite some debate about who can be called a Yankee. A poem by E.B. White, the writer of Stuart Little and Charlotte's Webb among other things, put it best. To foreigners, a Yankee is an American. To an American, a Yankee is a Northerner. To a Northerner, a Yankee is an Easterner. To an Easterner, a Yankee is a New Englander. To a New Englander, a Yankee is a Vermonter. And in Vermont, a Yankee is someone who eats pie for breakfast. Pie for breakfast is apparently a traditional meal in the state, according to the aptly named Yankee chef. Yankee, or Yank as it's often shortened to, which by the way I'll probably be using a mix of in this video as and when, is more than just a geographic nickname however, there is a stereotype linked to the name too. I saw this stereotype encapsulated in the term Yankee ingenuity. This term means to be invented and have technical know-how. It also means to have a mentality of making do with the tools and resources you have on hand. It seems to derive from those early settlers and colonists in the New England region, who did just have to make do with what they could find in the land when they first arrived. The 30th US president, Calvin Coolidge, is seen as being a very stereotypical Yankee due to his blunt manner of speaking and dry sense of humour. This was very much seen as a positive thing however. In the run up to his election, a fellow member of his party said that his Yankee twang will be worth 100,000 votes. While Calvin Coolidge might be an example of the name Yankee being used in a positive manner, this doesn't always seem to be the case. When looking into the name Yankee, a popular question comes up as to whether it's an offensive derogatory name or not. This doesn't really seem to be a question of a simple yes or no answer. From what I read online, the name varies in offence depending on where you're using it and who you are saying it to. In other nations, Yankee is seen as something as an affectionate slash endearing term for those in the state, while apparently in the New England area the term is hardly used. I read it can even be quite patriotic to be called a Yankee unless you're being called it in Boston, where it's really quite an offensive term, but that's a whole baseball thing. Calling someone from the southern United States a Yank, however, is a very different story, it would seem. Calling a southerner a Yank is a no-go because the name gained popularity as a word they would use as derogative for northerners during the Civil War, so obviously wouldn't like to be called it themselves. This kind of creates this weird thing where it can be offensive depending on who is using it. In example, some from the south are calling someone from the north North Yank is often derogative, while someone from say Britain calling someone from the North Yank isn't often derogative. Though I must stress this is only from research I've done online. If you have first hand experience with being called a Yank or calling someone a Yank then let me know down below. And huge apologies if this name does offend you and I've been saying it left right and centre. It seems that Yankee started life as a derogatory term, but has softened over the years, though its appropriateness has ebbed and flowed too it would seem. Unsurprisingly however, before Americans from the South were calling other Americans Yankee, it was the British who was first seemingly using the name. The earliest written recording of the name Yankee we have comes from 1758, while the USA was still a British colony. It comes from a letter written by James Wolfe, a British general. In the letter he wrote, I can afford you two companies of Yankees, and the more because they are better for arranging and scouting, than either work or vigilance. It's thought this letter was in regards to sending more troops to the French and Indian wars, in which Britain were wrapped up in over the time. It's hard to deter from this letter if the name Yankee is being used in a derogative sense here though, or if it's just being used as a go-to name. However, in 1775, it was most certainly being used in an offensive manner in a British loyalist newspaper cartoon, ridiculing the Yankee Doodle soldiers. More on that term in a moment. What's interesting however is that the name was being used by people from New England pretty soon after this. 1769 gave us the first Pen and Might Yankee War. It seems that the Yankees in this war were quite openly calling themselves this name here. And as mentioned, Yankee Doodle went from being a song created by the British to insult the Americans to a marching song the Americans sung with pride.
tried. Though as the years would go on and the states became an independent nation, the word fluctuated in use. It seems to become its most derogative during the American Civil War, from 1861 to 1865. In this time, Yankee and Yank became the go-to term for those in the northern states. It was used in a derogatory sense by Southern Americans, from the 11 states that left the Union and formed the Confederate States of America. In this time, it was often preceded with the word damn. Damn Yankee became something of a go-to term for the Confederates to say in anger at their northern enemies. However, when this war came to an end, Yankee seemingly became a neutral term for those from New England once again. And from here, the name has become the nickname it is known as today. While that may be a brief look into the word's history, where did it come from in the first place? Minus York, as in New York, which is in the north, Yankee doesn't sound particularly like any place names in this region of the USA. So, where did the name come from? Well, we aren't too sure. There are a few ideas as to where the name comes from. Some of these etymologies are more debunked than others. Still, folk etymologies are fun to look at. If you were to ask me where I thought the name came from, I would suggest it's a diminution of the surname Yankovic, a popular Jewish American surname. And with a huge majority of the Jewish American population living in the Northeast, it would make sense. However, there isn't a link between Yankovic and Yankee. Like I said, that would just be my theory on the etymology. Some other debunked etymologies that come from Native American roots. One idea is that it came from a Cherokee word, that being Yankee, with this word supposedly meaning coward. I say supposedly meaning coward, as this word doesn't actually exist in the Cherokee language. So why would this folk etymology come about? Well, according to Dave Wilton in his fantastic book Word Myths, a key reason as to why folk etymologies are perpetuated is to reinforce negative ideas about others. And you could easily see this etymology gaining traction in the south during the height of the civil war. Believing their nickname for their enemy meant coward would have helped cement their negative idea of the northerners. David Wilton however also says a key reason folk etymologies gain traction is to strengthen and validate group identity and this links with another Yankee Native American folk etymology. This etymology being the word derived from the name of a native tribe called the Yanku slash Yankos with this tribe's name meaning invincible. The story goes that New England settlers defeated this tribe and took their name. However, beyond this story, we have no evidence of this tribe ever existing. Though, as mentioned, this folk etymology helps strengthen the group identity of the Yankees, that's for sure. You'd feel pretty great if you knew your nickname meant invincible. A final, not as debunked, Native American etymology idea is that was an English corruption of a native corruption of a French term. That French term being l'anglais, meaning the Englishman slash English language. A Wyandotte native would have heard this term and pronounced it as Yangi, which the English would have heard and pronounced it as Yankee. But if it doesn't come from native roots, then where does it come from? Well, it's more popularly believed to be a name created by another group of settlers in the northeast of the states, that being none other than the Dutch. Dutch colonization of North East America, known as New Netherlands, seems to have only really been around during the 17th century. However, their impact has been massive. Perhaps most noticeably, they set the groundwork for their city of New Amsterdam, which would eventually be renamed New York by the British. Though the name Yankee could quite possibly be their biggest contribution to the Americas and to American English, we have a few ideas as to how the Dutch may have given us the name Yankee, most relate to popular Dutch given names. This is a pretty common nickname origin too, to link an entire group of people with just one given name, like with Tommies as a name for British soldiers during the First World War. Yankee is thought to possibly come from the Dutch name of Jan, their version of John. The feminine form of Jan is Janneke, which sounds somewhat like Yankee too. So it's thought that with all these new Jans and Jannekes coming into the land, the name was applied to all the Dutch settlers, then everyone in the northeast, and then corrupted into Yankee and shortened to Yank. The other idea again relates to the Dutch Jan, but not its feminine form. It instead relates to the other popular Dutch given name of Keys. All these Jan and Keys coming to the land could have been combined into Young Keys, which was then corrupted into Yankees. We even have records of Dutch people with the double barreled first name of Young Keys. These Dutch ideas really make a lot of sense. What we aren't too sure about, however, is if these names were used in a derogatory way towards the Dutch settlers or not. I'm just happy that the letter J makes a Y sound in Dutch, otherwise these Americans would have ended up with the nickname of Jankies, which just sounds a little bit more janky.
Donald J. Trump's term as President of the United States of America has officially come to an end. This means his time as Commander-in-Chief and the past four years are officially in the history books. And as I mentioned in my COVID-19 video, it's when something is in the history books I feel more inclined to finally talk about it. Despite the fact the dust is far from settled in this case. Trust me, I've wanted to talk about Trump in detail for some time now. Most of Name Explain's existence has been during the Trump administration. Administration. And while I've held off for the majority of these four years, I've mentioned him at times when appropriate. Trump's time as president was incredibly unique. Pretty much every factor and aspect of his tenure as president can be considered unique to him, and it seems everything he did was worth talking about and raised an eyebrow or two. Luckily for us and our love of nomenclature, this even includes his use of names. Trump has a very interesting, somewhat bizarre relationship with names. This includes his own name and nicknames of it, names he used for other people, and even the pseudonyms he used in the past. So today, with the Trump presidency firmly in our rearview mirror, let's look into Donald Trump's bizarre relationship with names. Dave, before we continue, I just want to say I have a suspicion that this video might get demonetized for reasons. So if you enjoyed the channel and want to help support it when YouTube does things like this, then please consider donating monthly on Patreon. Just $1 a month really helps out in a huge way and gets you many extras, including ad-free videos, exclusive content, and a say in which names get explained. There will be a link down below, and thank you so much to everyone who does support me on there. Name explain wouldn't be what it is today without you guys. Anyway, I guess before we delve into Trump's use of language and the social linguistic side of things, let's understand the etymology of his actual name, Donald Trump. Starting with that first name of Donald. This name is of course of Scottish origins, and I've seen it identified as the Scottish version of the name Domhall. The name is believed to mean ruler of the world and even proud chief, which I suppose is a very fitting name for someone who was the ruler of one of the most powerful nations on earth. Donald isn't a particular popular name, especially in recent years. And there's some fascinating articles out there by people with the name Donald, and how this Donald's time as Commander-in-Chief has affected them. There's also people out there with the exact same first and last name as Donald Trump, but that's a story for another time. As for that surname of Trump, well it appears to be of Germanic origins and means drum. This surname also came about in English via Old French meaning someone who makes trumpets, but as we know Donald Trump's heritage is from Germany, it's more likely his name comes from drums, not trumpet. Interesting how both names relate to instruments though. In his initial campaign for presidency in 2016, it was reported that Trump's family name is actually Drumpf, and that more people should call him Donald Trump. This is somewhat true, though not entirely. As mentioned, Trump has German roots, and while Trump was the initial family surname, at some point during the family's time in the USA, it was turned into Trump, and Donald Trump himself never actually bared the surname of Trump. What's also interesting with the surname of Trump is the words other meanings. Trump is something of a verb too that doesn't relate to acting like the president, but means things like outplay or surpass or do better than. The word in this situation is most often linked to cards. I'm sure you've heard the term Trump card or even know of the card game Top Trumps. I'm sure many find it very fitting that Donald Trump's surname can also mean things like to outdo and surpass, especially when linked with his first name meaning chief slash ruler. This could be seen as something of an Aptronym, and maybe some nominative determinism has come into play through his life thanks to his name. If you aren't aware, aptronyms are when your name fits what you do, like how the fastest person alive has the surname Bolt. And nominative determinism is the concept of how your name and what it sounds like and what its meaning is may affect the rest of your life and career. We have a whole video about it on the channel you should go check out, it's a personal favourite of mine. Though the word Trump doesn't only mean to outdo others, it has other, less pleasant meanings too. Here here in the United Kingdom, and maybe in other parts of the world, Trump is actually another word for something else entirely. A Trump is another name for a fart. So yes, this president could also be seen as being called Donald Fart. Proceed with that information as you see fit. Trump is clearly a big fan of his own name. He has named a huge variety of things after himself, from Trump Tower to his Trump golf courses. Most things he own have the word Trump plastered on them. While this might make him seem pretty darn egotistical, it's not the most uncommon thing to name things like buildings and businesses after yourself. He also has a variety of nicknames too, such as the Donald, and his secret service code name is fittingly Mogul. It's more than just the name Donald Trump we are interested in today, however. As mentioned, it's 
Pence's use of names that compelled me to create this video. A key component of Trump's presidency and his campaigns were his use of names and nicknames for the people he liked and didn't like. Seriously, I'm not being hyperbolic when I say this. There's a literally an entire Wikipedia page for nicknames he used. These were the names given to other US politicians, politicians from around the world, media personalities, even organizations and world events. You can go search for these nicknames for yourself, but just to share a few examples, we have the name Wild Bill for former President Bill Clinton, Mike Pounce for his VP Mike Pence, Sloppy Steve for his former strategist Steve Bannon, Britain Trump for UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson, Trump of the Tropics for Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, Little Rocket Man for North Korean leader Kim Jong-un, Tim Apple for Apple CEO Tim Cook, The Clinton News Network for CNN, and he called COVID-19 the plague from China and Kung Flu. As stated, these are just a few examples. But what we can see from these samples is that he used nicknames for both people he liked and disliked, and it wasn't just politicians who were targeted by his nicknames. Undoubtedly though, the most renowned nicknames were the ones he used for those who ran against him in the presidential campaigns. For Hillary Clinton, he most noticeably used Crooked Hillary, and for Joe Biden, he used Sleepy Joe. It's one thing to just point out these nicknames, but why did he use them so much? Well, I theorize it's for a few reasons. Trump's use of language as a whole can be examined in great detail, from his speeches to his tweets. We are just here, however, to look at his names, and most of these nicknames are usually just a person's name preceded by a certain adjective. Trump exhibited a pattern of using extreme, simple to understand words to get his point across to as many people as possible. His repetition of certain adjectives are intended to be drilled into the brains of his followers, in the hopes that those adjectives get linked to the people he is using them for. These adjectives he used tended to be single attributes, attributes Trump wanted that person to be known for. He called Hillary Clinton Crooked Hillary so much in the hopes that crooked would be the first word that came to the minds of people when they thought about her. Same goes for Sleepy Joe. He basically wanted these words to be associated with these people, and it even went beyond just people. Fake is an adjective that is perhaps now most associated with the noun of news. That's something Trump played a huge role in. One nickname he used was Crazy Nancy, that being for the Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi. This nickname of Crazy Nancy was used by TV host Jim Cramer in an interview with her. He called her that to her face. He then apologized for using it saying that was the president. This can be seen as a prime example of Trump's name calling winning out. Jim Cramer had become so desensitized to hearing her being called Crazy Nancy that when talking to her he used that name too. Of course that's just one example. Many of the nicknames Trump used haven't had a lasting impact on those he gave them to. The favor has been returned however and people have given Trump just as unpleasant nicknames too. This includes the likes of Cheeto Jesus, Captain Chaos and Rome Burning in man form. Though it wasn't just his opponents who gave Trump fake names as this is where things get even weirder as Trump has a history of giving himself fake names too. Trump has used a variety of pseudonyms over the years, most of which he used before his time as president. The most noticeable of these was the name John Barron. This is the name Trump used throughout the 80s. When reporters called the Trump organization to request interviews of the man, they were often put through to Trump's spokesperson, John Barron. Of course, this spokesperson of John Barron was just Trump using a different name. As Barron, Trump would defend himself and big himself up. Also, not having time to talk to the press and use a spokesperson instead made him look way more busy and important. Journalists were of course suspicious that they were talking to Trump. He has such a unique way of speaking, it would be hard to not mistake him. Even when recordings of these calls got out, many believed it was Trump. He of course denied it many times. Perhaps he would still be using this name if it weren't for a 1990 lawsuit where under oath he had to testify and admitted that on occasion he had used that name. What's worth noting is that John is actually Trump's middle name and he would go on to use Baron as the first name of his youngest child, Baron Trump. Whether he was inspired to use the name due to it being his old pseudonym, however, we aren't too sure. It was only one year later in 1999 that a new pseudonym would emerge. A reporter from People's Magazine called to ask about his marriage to Ivana. She was put through to Trump's publicist, John Miller, who boasted about Trump and his love life and his finances. Of course, John Miller was yet again Trump using a different name. This phone call resurfaced in 2016 during his election campaign and of course he denied that it was him. A year later in 1992 a letter was published in New York magazine from Caroline Galeo. In her letter she was supporting Trump and defending the way he treated women. It's heavily suspected that this letter was written yet again by Trump under a fake name. A key part
part of this belief is due to how similar his letter is to Trump's own writing style. At one point, quote unquote, Caroline says, I do not believe any man in America gets more calls from women wanting to see him, meet him, or go out with him. The most beautiful women, the most successful women, all women love Donald Trump. It's hard to deny this sounds something like Trump would say. One last fake name Trump has gone under was David Dennison. This was much later than in the 90s, in 2016 to be precise, when this name was used in place of his own, in a non-disclosure agreement, to conceal allegations with actress Stormy Daniels. I guess the question here is why use these fake names? I've seen a few ideas, one being to present a much grander image of himself, to pretend he has spokespersons, secretaries and publicists to speak on his behalf as he is simply too busy, though I also read it could simply have been a joke Trump was pulling. He knew people would know it's him and he was just playing around. It's one of those things we may never really know the answer to. Regardless, that's pretty much everything I wanted to share about the 45th President of the United States. There's an awful a lot to unpack about this man, and while his time in office is now over, I have no doubt it will be talked about for years to come. Though perhaps the most interesting part of his career, for us anyway, is his bizarre use of names.